He says, only when you attain to the tenth world, which he called Buddhahood, we would call Christ consciousness, which is meditation. Only when you attain to that tenth world can you see clearly. And then the decisions that you made can be made on the basis of life the way it really is, not the way you want it to be or the way you think it's going to be. But how is it really? How, how do you draw things to you? How do you attract things to you that are positive? How do you make decisions in your life that are positive? You know, coming in here and meditating is coming in here and meditating. You still got to go up the stairs and out the door, and there you're involved with everything that is, in, for the most part, can be very hostile to you. It doesn't make any difference whether it's a relationship with your family, a relationship on your job, a relationship with the government, the, the police, whoever it is. They don't want to hear about, well, I meditate. Yeah, big deal, but you still ran the red light, so you're going to, you know, you're going to pay the money. Well, I meditate. Yeah, but you haven't paid for the car, so we're going to come pick the car up. See? So there's a, there's a reality involved in all of this, and unfortunately, much of church becomes very difficult uh, for the average person to deal with because you're told if you do this everything is going to be okay and you do that and it's not okay so then you say oh my god what that causes you to do is lose faith in Christ because you were told if you did this particular hocus pocus he was going to come down and take care of everything well you've done it and everything is as screwed up as it was before in fact maybe it's a little worse than it was before so now let's take a, a cause and, 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 and a renge a cause and effect Buddha says the cause of all suffering. Let's take it. The cause of all suffering. And he summed it up in one word. He says the cause of all suffering is desire. Everything, everything that has hurt you in your life has come as the result of either a desire that you have or a desire that somebody else has. Sometimes some other person has a desire to have what you have. And they'll take it and it's going to cause you to suffer. Or you may desire to have something somebody else has, and you try to take it, and you're going to suffer. And basically, if you get into psychological terms now, the way that psychologists teach you not only personally one-on-one -on -one psychology, but they'll teach you like in corporate psychology, what I get involved in often, is if you want to find the root cause, and that's the important thing, finding the root cause of the problem. What is the root cause of the problem? Then you have to do what they call the repetitive whys. You take the problem, you put it on a piece of paper, you say, I should be happy. You draw a line down the center of the paper, on the other side you put, but I'm not. That's the problem. Now the next step is, why aren't you happy? I say, because of this. Then you say, well, if that exists, why does that exist? Well, that exists because of so-and-so. Well, why does so-and-so? And right on down the line, and those repetitive whys will eventually take you right to the center, and you'll find out the cause, the root cause of the suffering. As I said, it's just like a, a, an infected tooth. You know, you can, take, uh, you can take pain pills and you can take aspirins, but all the while that thing is doing damage in there until it's rooted out. And that's what Chakyamuni Buddha tried to tell the world, that the cause of all suffering is desire. And it does, and it can come in various shapes and various things. But see, when you go into what he said was the necessary thing to do and start understanding yourself and you go into the aspect of meditation, then you begin to see things and your desires change because you start to conform with the changes inside of you so that you look at things outside much differently than you did before. Your desires are nowhere near what they used to be. Joan and I first got married. Our desires were to max out every credit card that we had as quickly as we could. And that's what we would do. We'd go to Bamberger's and we'd just buy and buy and buy until that terrible time came, you know. We'd go up, Joan would hand our credit card, and it would light up. The red light would come on in the lady's machine. And, of course, the thing you'd say was, there must be some mistake. This is outrageous. I demand to see somebody. And they'd give you the card back, and you'd go out, and I'd say, well, well let's go to Sears. And so we jump in there, and we take another, and we get our Sears, and we go, and we, yeah, that's what we did. We left a trail of credit cards all over the place, you know. But that was the desires at that time. They don't exist, and, and there's nothing wrong with probably that, because everybody has to experience that. You have to go through that. We did everything. I mean, since we've been married, we, we bought, we had boats, and we used to, and I was notoriously seasick, and I was the captain of the boat. <laughs> Nobody up there knew. They're having a good time. They're slugging down the beer, and they're having a thing, and I'm up there seasick, and I'm steering the thing. They could have all died. They didn't know. 
We went and got motor homes. We bought a motor home, went up through Canada, up to the British Columbia. One time we had this truck camper, and um, we, we, we took five kids with us on a, on a trip. From here, we went up to uh, Montreal, made a left turn at Montreal, and went all the way out to British Columbia, out at the Canadian Rockies, with five kids in this truck camper. They weren't our kids, these people, and two dogs in this truck camper. Two dogs, five kids. And we got up, in, in, up near Lake Louise, up in British Columbia, really rugged stuff. And uh, we, we got all set up in the camp, you know, and Joan was out there with the children, and they were all making burgers and getting the picnic tables. All of a sudden, from out of the woods, is this big bear. I mean, a big bear was standing there. Well, I did the thing that you should do. I grabbed the dogs, jumped in the truck, and locked the doors. <laughs> She was outside with the five kids, and then, open the door. I said, not on your life. There's a bear out there. You remember that? So she fought her way in, and she got in, the, and four kids got into the tr truck, and there was that bear standing there, and four kids got in, and one kid, little Brian, and uh, Stephen, and he came out of the woods. He had gone to get water or something, and he, he came into the clearing and saw the camper and saw the bear, and this kid made it to the truck. His feet never hit the ground. Boom, boy. That was <laughs> but these were all things we wanted to do, and we did them. So that, that, that's nothing, there's nothing wrong with that. Because you'll never realize how screwed up you can get unless you screw up. You know, that's, that's just part of the learning process. You know, like they say, you'll never understand how bitter the bitter water tastes unless you drink it. Because, and, and, and if somebody's going to say, you shouldn't really do that, as soon as they tell you you shouldn't do that, you know, that's what you want to do. I'm going to do that. Remember when we were kids in the Catholic Church, they used to have the movie ratings, they had the Legion of Decency. So we didn't look to say, uh, you know, Little Red Riding Hood was an approved movie. We went down to see Lust in the Moonlight. Yeah, we want to go see this one. Because they said, don't go see it. I didn't know what Lust in the Moonlight. Oh, I know, it was on a thing you weren't supposed to see. And as soon as somebody tells you you're not supposed to do this, that's the thing that you want to do. And that's, that's okay, and that's nothing wrong with that, because you're going to have to do it. People are going to say, don't do it, but you're going to have to work out your own future and your own life, and, 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 and things will work their way out as you experience these things. But as you go now into this concept of meditation, the blinders fall down, the distortion goes away, you start to see clearly what's going on. That's why it is so terribly, terribly important that when you, you can, you come on Tuesday nights and get into that meditation and really work at it. I don't care how boring it may get. This is what's important to break down the barriers of the left side of the mind. You're thinking 99% of your time, you're thinking vertically. You're thinking with the left side of the brain. And that's not what you're supposed to do. Jesus said, cast your net to the right side. And he said that because he was saying you have to start thinking laterally. That's what Buddha said, that's what Krishna said, that's what psychology says. You have to think laterally. You have to activate the creative part of your mind. Let me give you an, an idea of thinking laterally and thinking vertically. Uh, there was a story of uh, these people who uh, had a house and they were in, you know, years ago, they were in debt to the lender. And the lender said, you know, I got to have your money or I'm going to throw you in jail if you don't have the money and if you don't, or I'm going to take your house. But the lender didn't want to look as a bad guy. So what he said, I'll, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll take a smooth stone and I'll take a rough stone and I'll put them in a bag. And you reach in and if you pick out the smooth stone, then I'll forgive the debt. You won't have to pay the debt. You won't have to go to jail. Everything will be okay. But if you pick out the rough stone, then I get everything. So... The wife stood there, and the man picked up. But when he picked up the stones to put him in the bag, he picked up two rough stones, put him in the bag. So the question is, what would you do? What would you do? Most people would say, I would tell this guy, hey, wait a minute, you put two rough stones. Well, that's thinking laterally. Excuse me, that's thinking vertically. That's thinking with the carnal mind. That's a knee-jerk reaction that comes from the carnal mind, and that's what most of us do, and that's what religion tells you to do, okay? So what science is saying, what, what God is saying, don't do that because now this guy's really going to get ticked off, and he's going to want his money. You're in, no, you're in no condition to say, hey, you put two rough stones. You don't forget, you owe this guy for that. He's going to take the house, put you in jail and everything. So let's start meditating and thinking creatively. Let's do this. Let's take one of the rough stones out of the bag, drop it, kick it with our foot, say, oh, I don't know where it is, but we can tell which stone it was because we can look in the bag and see what's left. 
The only thing left in there is a rough stone. Oh, I must have picked the smooth stone. So now I can keep my house and the debt is forgiven. You have, uh, you have wheeled and dealed, um, you know, a little crooked here, but that's all right. You saved your house. And you thought creatively. You energized. You thought laterally instead of thinking vertically. But most of us knee jerk instantly. This is what we're going to do. And without meditation, you're always going to think vertically. See, because what did, what did Buddha say? You're looking at the situation from a distorted view. It's like having defective glasses on. Come with me to page 939 in the Bible. Look at 1 Corinthians. And let's see if we can, uh, if we can come up with something. 1 Corinthians, and let's look at chapter 13, okay? 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And let's take a look at verse 12 and see what the Ap uh, Apostle Paul says. Okay. First, Cor oh God, I'm in the wrong one. First Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 12. For now we see through a glass darkly. Okay. That's exactly what Shakyamuni Buddha tried to tell you. What you're looking at on, you're looking at on, and you're seeing a distorted picture. You don't realize this. You think it's right but you're seeing a distorted picture. So you're going to make a decision based on that distortion, and you're going to get in trouble every single time. You're going to get in trouble, okay? But then, face to face, see? Now, in other words, you're looking at, you can't see clearly. You think you're seeing clearly, but you're not. So the decision you're making, you're going to make is wrong, but then face to face. Now, put your finger in there and go to page 28 in your Bible. Go to the book of Genesis. Okay, go to the book of Genesis and go to page 28 in the little Bible. Go to Genesis chapter 32 and let's go to verse 30. Okay, page 28, Genesis 32 and let's go to verse 30. And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face and my life is preserved. You don't have to be a nuclear scientist to know what that means. The single eye, the activation of the single eye, the activation of the pineal gland brings you to a point where you see what is God, that which is the creative force within you face to face. God is the creator and the creator inside of you is the right hemisphere of the brain. That's the creative side. And I mean, if you don't have to be religious or spiritual or Christian or whatever, Buddhist, to understand that. You can go to any doctor or any psychologist or psychiatrist, and they'll tell you the creative side is the right hemisphere. That's where God creates. And that's where you will then begin to think with the mind of Christ and create solutions to your problems instead of knee-jerk and reaction and getting yourself in all kinds of trouble. That's why meditation is so tremendously important. Go back to 1 Corinthians 13 where you are on page 939, okay? But then face to face, now I know in part, aha, uh -huh, that's the human aspect. That's the 10%. Here you are, okay? There you are. And here is the part that you use to think with. 10%. Here's the part that you don't touch. 90%. You don't touch it. See, that's what he said. Now I know it. How can you know everything that you should know when you're only using 10% of your brain? Go out in your car, and if you've got an eight-cylinder car, disconnect six of the cylinders and see what happens. You know, the, the spark plugs. Take it off and see. That's exactly what we've done. We've disconnected eight of the ten spark plugs that are in our cylinder for life, and we're trying to think and say, oh, I can figure this out. Sure, you think you can, but remember, you're only using 10%. So this is the reason for all of our problems, because we see defectively. And as Apostle Paul says, but now I know in part. But then I shall know, even as also I am known. Okay? In other words, you know God in the same way that you know yourself. How? Through consciousness. Through the inner realms of consciousness. And now these things you can do. This does not cost you any money to do this. It does not require you to join any church to do it. It does not require you to go anywhere special to do it. It requires you to pay attention to what has been taught by the ancients through Krishna, Buddha, Jesus. It requires you to wake up and simply say to yourself, hey, wait a minute, I have seen a demonstration of religion for 2,000 years. They've never stopped killing each other, violating one another, scaring each other, and scaring me. There is a different way, and the way is within, as Jesus Christ said, the kingdom being within you. Let's take a look at a real scene. 
And, and maybe you can maybe you can apply yourself to the scene. And this is a scene that Shakyamuni taught. He taught like this in different ways because this is a couple three three thousand, four thousand years ago. But it was the same general ideas that he gave. But let's take a real scene. Let's take a look at hell. Okay. And many of you have had very close looks at hell. Many of you have have, have really you know the neighborhood very well. And uh, you know that's because everybody has been there. At one time or another, you've been there. And, I, and then at one time or another, in, in, the, in, the, in the case of a violent reaction of your, your temper, you've said, this is hell. I mean, you've all, had, you've all said that at one time or another, and you're absolutely right. That's what it was. But here's the scenario in a way that uh, Shahimuni would teach it. You lose your job. Okay? The first thing that happens when you lose your job is you become very angry. Because you're going all over the place, and you cannot find a job. No matter how hard you try, you cannot find a job. And you get very, very angry and very, very, you know, you really, a lot of great deal of suffering going on with it. And really, the, the, the anger is not because there's no jobs out there. The anger is with yourself because you can't find a job. I mean, <laughs> hey, Joe's got a job. I mean, Dave's got a job. And all of a sudden, I don't have a job. I went through that. I remember one time I made this statement to... Uh, Guy said, we want you to come to Trenton and continue to be an insurance adjuster. I said, no. I quit. How, you know, what? I quit. I quit this job. I had Blue Cross and all of this stuff, you know, my security. And uh, I went home and told Joan I quit. And uh, she had been, um, you know, head nurse in a hospital and had charge of this intensive unit and with all this. And then right after that, she quit her job. What was going on? And we didn't know that some intelligence was setting up us for this. We had no idea at the time. But after I quit my job, all I knew was I felt almost like disgraced. I mean, you know, I don't, what am I going to do? I didn't want to even go get unemployment. I mean, I, you know, I didn't know what to do. And so what I did was I started to turn in on myself and take it out on myself and start to become violent and do all of these things that we do, screaming and kicking things and going, you know, really a lot of suffering inside. But what happens to most of us then is this is where Shakyamuni Buddha says really trouble starts. What happens is after a period of time, the frustration gradually lessens, okay? Because what we do is we begin to adjust to the situation. We learn how to live with not as much as we used to have. We, we learn how to conserve, so we don't, have as, we don't need to spend the kind of money we used to spend. We don't need to have that, the types of things that we used to have, because we can't. So we have to tighten our belt. And we do. We tighten our belt. You know, we've got to live a little more frugally, and pretty soon we start to get used to it. So then you begin to limit your desires, you limit your, your horizons, and your whole life starts to become very narrow. Because instead of championing and seeing this problem from a different perspective on the right side, you have accepted the situation, you have been beaten down, you have lost, you have thrown up your hands, there's no way out of this thing. And so now you start to adjust yourself to accepting a new style. Although you may not realize it, Shakyamuni Buddha says you have accepted living in hell. And he said, what? And this is a magnificent description of hell. I want you to listen to it very carefully. See if you recognize it. He says it is the dull, aching state of life with little hope. And you've accepted it. And you've accepted it because you weren't able to see any way out of the problem. Because you're looking from over here. You never ever dreamed that if you started to activate those cells at the right side, you could begin to see. And that's what happens. What am I going to do? I don't know any way out of this. So you accept the conditions, and you're in hell, and you're living there. See? And this is what Buddha said, and I love this. Insects that live on smart weed forget how bitter it tastes. Insects that live on smart weed forget how bitter it tastes. In other words, they, they, they've lived on it so long, it doesn't make any difference. It's, it's a way of life. And listen to this comment from Shakyamuni Buddha 3,000 years ago. Those who live long near the toilet forget how foul the smell is. They get used to it. Did I repeat that? Talk about wisdom. Those who live long near the toilet 
forget how foul the smell is. They get used to it. So what he says is when you begin the meditation, when you begin the chant, when you begin to turn this thing around and enter within yourself, then the change happens over the situation. And it's totally up to you. It's totally up to saying, will you apply this thing or not? Are you going to be bored with it or not? Are you going to, are you going to be determined or, or are you going to allow this thing and this, this lifestyle to continue? The first change that happens to you when you get into this and you start the meditation and you start the miyaho, whatever it is, the first change seems to be that the thing gets worse. The thing gets worse. You feel it's worse. I'm meditating. I'm saying, yo, ho, ring, I care. The whole fuck is going up. I'm going down. This is worse. I shouldn't have done this. Right. The first thing that you'll feel, I shouldn't be doing this. This is, you know, it was bad, but now it even seems to be worse. And many people will run away from meditation because of that. Many people will run away from this whole concept because of that. Thing is worse. And they'll get somebody say, well, you know, you should just read this and say this and all of this type of thing. But no, no, no. What Shakyamuni said is, the truth is, the situation has not gotten worse. It's just that finally, through mind change, you have begun to notice just how foul-smelling is the toilet that you have been living near for so long. For the first time, maybe in years, you begin to smell the crumb. And you say, I don't want to live like this anymore. This was your normal lifestyle, and you accepted it. Because the system had put you down. Religion had put you down. The government had put you down. Parents had put you down. School had put you down. And finally, you were put down so deeply that you determined, this is the way I've got to live. And then suddenly, as you begin to understand and hear things from the right side, you realize, this is not a way for me to live. This is not a way for decent people. Are you going to sit here and tell me that in the realm of 1992, the technology available, the money available, the power available, that there have to be people starving? Who's doing that? Where are all these damn churches that are so holy and they got you saying this and laying hands on this? Where are they? Where, where is everybody? Where is all of these, all of these people, all these do-gooders? Where are they? Who cares whether 30,000, you know, the average life of a little child in Africa in the desert, how long do those children live? Do you ever see them with flies crawling on their face? Do you know, and you're going to pray to God and say, oh, bless me, and his screwball on television is going to come and say, now walk and your leg feels better, doesn't it? Oh, his leg feels better when 30,000 little black kids die in Africa yesterday because this wonderful God is more concerned about this guy's leg than 30,000 children dying of starvation? And oh, God, you know, we're going to fight onward Christian soldiers. What a rotten song that is. That's not the way Jesus ever, th Jesus would never use the word onward Christian soldiers. He'd say, as Buddha would say, unclench your fist, turn the other cheek, and be at peace. Hmm. It's a disgusting demonstration that has happened in this world. All, whether it be the degrading of, of minority people, whether it be the put down of people because they're what sex they are, women, whether it be the, the total disregard of children starving, not only in Africa, you can take a look right here. Oh, it's very easy to get mad at people when they set fire to stores. You want to live like they live? What would you do? You might set fire to a few stores yourself if you had to live like that. You get to a point, like he said, you get to a point where. You don't even know there's any chances. You don't even know there's any possibility. You take a guy, you take somebody that's living in a Los Angeles or in, in Harlem or somewhere, and, 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 you, and you put him in a new suit, and you put him in a house in Hyannisport, and you put him in a fancy job and a nice car to drive to Washington or a plane to fly into Washington. He ain't going to set fire to any stores. Who's kidding who? What he says, it is not only individuals who look at things distorted, but it's people who read you, who make your laws, who are looking through defective glasses and see a distorted view. And when they make decisions, you may make decisions, may hurt your wife, may hurt your kids, but when these people make decisions, they hurt everybody. Hurt the world, hurt the animals, hurt the ecology. 
And Buddha said it is extremely important that you start smelling the toilet because it stirs you out of the apathetic attitude that this is where you are and this is what you've got to be. You don't. You don't have to live in poverty. You don't have to live from hand to mouth every day. You don't. And when you resurrect and get into this thing and get into the right hemisphere and start shaking your fist and raising the power of God and let it flow through you, the money will come back to the poor people. The freedom will come back to the poor people. The food will come back to the poor people. But as long as you're going to sit there and say, they got me, then they got you. As long as you're going to follow the mob into a church and sit down and sing Amazing Grace while you're dying inside, they got you. So you'll either fight this enlightenment that's coming to you and you'll go back and jump in the toilet again or perhaps hope will flare from within you. You know, you know there's a lot of people and once you come into this meditation you know there's a lot of people that'll go into that bathroom, the spiritual bathroom and try to jump back in the toilet. And when you're trying to get in the toilet there's a great arm within you pulling you back and saying don't go back to that. Don't go back. It's so easy to want to jump back in. You don't have to live like the way you've been living. When you, that Buddha chant that Chakyamuni talked of, Mio, Ho, Ringe, Kyo. This word is split in two parts, Mio and Ho, okay? This word here, Mio, also means, you know what this word also has another meaning? Do you know what it means? Revival is what it means. Revival. And it's not to come in and, like churches, let's have a revival so everybody brings a covered dish. That's the first step that it's not going to be a good time. You know? As soon as they uncover, as soon as they keep the dishes covered, it's wonderful. As soon as they uncover them, did you ever go to those things? 30,000 variations of ziti. <laughs> Mio means revival. But you know what he's talking about? Revive me. You, me, we need the revival in here. Come alive. Come up. Raise myself up. I don't have to. Did you ever, there was a, I forget what the name of the movie was, but this guy had everybody stick their heads out of the window and say, I'm mad as hell and I ain't going to take it anymore. What was it? Network. Network. That's what you all need to do. And once you, once, once, once you realize the power that's coming upon you through Christ consciousness, that will happen. You're not, you don't have to stand for second best. You don't have to be pushed around by the system because in the old days, yes, you couldn't do anything about it, but now there's a new system, and this system is the Christ system which is coming alive, and you turn that system on, and together. And you see it? You see what's happening? You see what's happening? You, you know what you got? Here you got, here you got in, the, in the politics in the United States. I'll show you how screwed up this thing is. You got some guy is about four foot high in Texas, his name is Ross Perot. Nobody knows what the heck this guy is for. They don't know whether he's for this or for They don't know it either. They don't, all they know is he's got a lot of money, and all they know is he's standing there, and he doesn't agree with the other two, so they say, let's vote for him. That's all. Because a revolution is stuff. There's a revolution. That's a tremendous revolution. It's never anything been like that in the, in the, in the history of the world. They're not saying this guy is any good. They're not saying, oh, we want to vote for him because he's good. We say we want to vote for him because the other two are Pakata. Already, we don't want this with these guys. It's like uh, Gorbachev. Gorbachev said, ah, we're going to change it a little bit. They said, you're not going to change it a little bit. You're going to go. The whole thing's going. Pfft, there, there, it's gone. How did that happen? Because this thing is stimulating within, you got seven billion crystal magnets in your brain, and Aquarius is raining down all kinds of electromagnetic fields, and people are starting to run around like hummingbirds. And they're so, what, flitting around here, all of a sudden they're getting signals to do things that they never thought they were going to do before. It's like the goose is up in Canada, and when the weather starts to get a little cool, the goose gets a signal. It says, I'm going to fly away. What are you going to fly? We've got all this food here because something tells me to fly. And so the goose said, Boop, off he goes. Murgatroyd takes off and a whole blasted pack of them. Everybody's flying and the last goose is saying, I hope you know where you're going. And he says, I don't know where I'm going, but I'm going anyhow. And they all fly. And then further down the road and a few thousand miles, they hear, Kukaracha, Kukaracha, ba 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 ta -ha And they land in Acapulco. How did he know? How did Murgatroyd know? How did all the rest of them know? 
They were going to Acapulco. Did they say, have you ever talked to a goose that said, have you ever been to Acapulco? They don't know where Acapulco is, but they go all the time. Why? They got a signal. You know why the people blew the communists out of the Soviet Union? They got a signal. You know why they're getting ready to blow all this thing to pieces in this country? They got a signal. And the seven billion magnets in your brain that are crystal are picking up signals from the universe that are saying, it is just about time. It is just about time. And that's what's going to happen. And it doesn't make any difference whether you vote for this guy or vote for that guy. You can vote for Prissy the cat. It's going to accomplish the same thing. Not going to make any difference. Because the signals are coming down, the little crystals in your head are tuned in, and the change is coming. And the poor and the oppressed are going to be given back what was taken from them. Watch it happen. There's a psalm in Psalm 85, verse 6, and it says, Will you not revive us again? Let me show you something. What does this do? Why is it important to do that? Okay? Let me show you why it's important to do that. Go to page 886 in the Bible. Book of John. Boy, I'll tell you something. When I had all this high blood pressure stuff, I'm doing pretty good now. Doing pretty good, thanks to all of you, and stopped eating salt and uh, trimmed down a little bit. You know, it's a terrible thing, though. You trim down, the doctor says, I've got to have you get, lose the weight, you know, get the blood pressure down, got the blood pressure down. Once you get the blood pressure down, you get feeling pretty good. All of a sudden, what happens? What did Buddha say in the beginning of this message? Desire. We walked in last night to a friend of our, you know, Dr. Reynolds, who's our veterinarian, who's moving to Florida, and we, they had a little going away party. We went in there last night, and as I turned into the living room, in the dining room, the first thing I laid my eyes on was a whole plate of chocolate-covered <laughs> huh? I knew better. The doctor said, well, oh, when I was laying on the table and my arm was pumping away at 200 over 500, whatever it was, the doctor says, oh, this is serious. Then I wouldn't touch a chocolate cookie. But now we've got chemicals, and the chemicals take down the blood pressure. So the blood pressure's all right. So I look in, and I see the cookies. So what did I do? I ate the cookies last night. Or all over there because I had you know, it is. Get back into things, you know. Look what it says here. John 21, verse 6. This is why I say Miyo Haringe Kia. What's jo John 21, verse 6? What did Jesus say to do? Cast your net to the right side. When you do that chant, you're casting your net to the right side. Why are you casting your net to the right side? Because the left side doesn't know what the hell you're talking about. Your left side doesn't know. When you're saying that, your left side can't grasp it, and the right side begins to grasp it. Why else? Go to page 781. What did Jesus say? Matthew 6, verse 22. Matthew 6, verse 22. The light of the body is the eye, if therefore thine eye be single. When you chant that, you are practicing the single eye and you are raising your consciousness into the realms of glory. One more reason, an important reason. Why do you say miyoho ringe kiyo? Cast your net to the right side, it practices the single eye. One more reason. Page 829, Book of Mark. Mark chapter 16, verse, page 829, verse 17, Jesus Christ our Lord, and these signs shall follow them that believe in my name, they shall cast out devils. You know what those devils are? Your damn thoughts. <laughs> Your thoughts. Have any of you ever had thoughts that were devils? You can shake your head, yes, because you know it. That's what casting out devils means. What did Jesus say? Take no thought. When you take no thought, you cast out devils. How do you do that? You cast your net to the right side. You practice the single eye. Why should I chant me a haringe kill? Verse 17, because they shall speak with new tongues. You and I had better start doing what Jesus Christ says to do. 
I'll teach you Buddha, I'll teach you Krishna, I'll teach you Campbell, I'll teach you Young, I'll teach you all of that stuff, but it comes down, everything must square with Jesus Christ. Because he's the teacher. He's my guru. Everything must square. Tongues. Say it, Mioho, Ringe, Kio, you've talked with tongues, you've practiced the single eye, you've cast your energy to the right side, all like that, fulfilling the, the commission of Jesus Christ. Because you can't make it work anyway. The right hemisphere of the brain is where the Father sits when you sit at the right hand of the Father. When the Father sits at the right side, it is because of the right hemisphere of the brain. The creative impulse is only open to that which is beyond the intellect. And when you start to talk to it, it doesn't understand. It can't deal with what you say. You've got to go through there through decibel and through impulse and through that magnetic field that are activated by that type of a thing. And what you know there was some interesting things of what Buddha said about that as we wrap it up. He says, doing this will be a lantern in the dark. Jesus Christ said your body will fill with light. He said doing this at times it will be water. Jesus Christ says, out of your innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Water in mysticism means truth. The truth will flow from you because the truth will begin to flow into you. Buddha says that other times it will be fire. Jesus says, I will baptize with the Holy Ghost and fire. Spirit, these people agree with each other. The same voice that comes from heaven. God sent this voice down from heaven to tell you, to say to you, through all ages, do you think that, Jesus, that God just sent a Jesus to take care of you and the Protestants and the Catholics? And the heck with everybody else? Don't you think? There were, do you know that it says in the Bible that Jesus was a high priest after the order of Melchizedek? Not before. He wasn't first. He was after the order of Melchizedek. What do you think? Do you think a man that gave his life like Shakyamuni in love to stand the suffering of people and to show people how the human mind works? This man was a master psychologist when there wasn't any such thing as a college. How, who taught him? He knew what Carl Jung knew. He knew what Patloff and all these other people knew. Who taught him? Don't you think you should listen? Hare Krishna, huh? You know what? If there was a guy, if there were people in the airport and they were selling roses in Jesus' name or to help support the, the, the Christian movement, you know what? Oh, isn't this wonderful? But were there a Hare Krishna? Oh, get him out of here. They're annoying me. Who was the strange person 7,000 years ago born of a virgin? Who was the strange person born in the cave? Who was the strange person that when he was born the star shone over the cave? Who was the strange person that when he was born the wicked king killed all the children two years and younger? Who was the strange person whose parents had to whisk him away, safely away from the wicked king? Who was it? His name was Hare Krishna. Story sound familiar? Only the names are changed. We think everything's reserved just for the evangelists on television. They really believe that. God is God, and his love is given to everyone in all of the universe from the beginning of time. One day, you suddenly realize that the problems no longer depress or frighten you don't worry about the things like you used to. I just finished this by telling you something that Shakyamuni taught. If you never have enough money to pay your bills, if you can't form good relationships with other people, you are not living a happy and fulfilled life. It doesn't mean that the person who has money and has friends is, because that person can be torn apart inside. But what Shakyamuni said, Ku is the invisible, key is the visible. You can call this spirit, you can call this physical. Shakyamuni said one is equally as important as the other and there has to be a harmony between the two of them. Not to have material things without spirit, not to have spirit without material things, they should complement. You know, he, wh what, what the ancients taught is that there's money all over the place. You'd say, yeah, where? I don't see any. Now, this is an ancient lesson, but you think about it and take it home. You can't prove it or disprove it. But some people, because of a deep problem in their invisible person, some people that have a psyche that is out of harmony have a problem attracting money into their lives. 
have a problem attracting friends, help into their lives. And that's how serious this is, because the chaos that's inside actually causes a negativity outside, and it becomes a wall and blocks you. And that's why so many people are hurt, and so many people live in constant poverty, because inside. And how, why is it so barren inside? Because the church and religion and the system has burned them and stripped them of that holiness inside. They have none. And so what's outside? It's negativity, and nothing comes to negativity. You begin to accept the poverty, your whole life is given to wheeling and dealing and trying to borrow from others and you're going to pay it back and you're going to pay it back and you're going to pay it back. And then when people who have this problem suddenly come into money because they're still looking through a distorted world, they don't even know how to deal with it and before you know it, it's gone. Never saved a dime. Never invested a nickel. It's gone. Where did it go? All of this money that was going to get me out of trouble. It's got, you want to see what I mean? Go around and people get second mortgages. Oh, I'll get this money. You ever see it on my television? You get this money and you consolidate all of your bills. We'll pay off all of your bills. And then you'll only have one little payment. Now you got this one payment. And then you go back out and you accumulate a whole bunch of other bills. So now you have all the bills that you had before, but on top of that, you got that other big thing. Destruction. Why? Because we're looking through distorted. We don't understand. Meditation is not to simply help you get to God. Meditation is to be Christ conscious so that you understand these things and you know how to deal and you know how to live and you know how to react and you know how to experience. This is the teaching of a man that religion has told you to stay away from. Trying desperately to tell you, for God Almighty's sake, don't accept this way of life. And for God Almighty's sakes, start to attract positive things to your outside by attracting a positive thing inside. Balance the inner and the outer life force so that you can enjoy the outer free from guilt and ignorance and free from poverty and free from all the hate and violence. and stress. That's the teachings of this man. And the more I read of him and the more I teach of him, the more I, I, I wonder about the system, its religions and Christianity and all the rest of it, that has turned a deaf ear to such wisdom. How did he learn all of this? He sat under a tree, it says, the Bodhi tree. Is that the Bodhi tree is? The tree of life. He ate from the tree of life. And he knew more than any of the psychologists in the world know who had gone to college. 20 years. He knew it all because he sat under the tree of life. Not bad. If you have an opportunity tonight, I'm starting teachings on the gentleman who started Joan and I into all of this, Joel Goldsmith. And I'd like to share his love and his majestic, mystical understandings with you, if you can. Thank you for being here. Uh, when you're done with the tape, Send it on to the next person as fast as you can. Send the card back to Mary. There's a route sheet inside. Put the route sheet back in the box. And when you send the tape off, the next person will know where they're to mail it. And Joan comes on and tells you. I, I have to stop for just a minute and thank all of you out there. I don't even think I've shared with you. Uh, we are, we're sending out about 150 tapes a month. Kathy Gill is the tape sender router, and she can tell you it just never stops, but uh, there's a big cost attached to buying the tapes and mailing the tapes and the mailers, and um, the people on the network have been just sensational over the last few weeks, and I just want to express a great deal of gratitude.